So Pete, you've been mentioning to me that you had this really interesting dream a couple weeks ago that you've wanted to talk about. So I've been curious to hear about it. Yeah, I think it's quite relevant to today's topic, which is on chaos, order, and how these two essential notions, life notions, relate to poker. But I want to tell you about the dream first, because I've been itching to hear your thoughts on it for like two weeks now. I've been holding it back like an irrepressible thing that I've wanted to share with you. So let's get into it, shall we? Let's do it. It's called Chaos, and I wrote this recollection of the dream as soon as I woke up from the dream. It's the first dream in like many years where I felt the need to record it instantly because it was that sort of shocking and deep, and it kind of like rattled me so much. It terrified the shit out of me, to be totally frank. So here we are. This is the dream, Chaos. I looked out the kitchen window. A large crevice had formed in the earth. Everything had moved. Carousels of undead were dancing in circles on high cylindrical revolving structures. Many of them were children, almost Victorian and rotten. They were empty and malevolent in the most callous, detached way. Then the lights went off in the house, and they were there too, charging up and down the living room. Andrea returned from a nightclub and apologised for having foam all over her clothes. Chaos. A fracturing of what I expect from her. She was, then she was still at the nightclub, and I was alone again. Time moving backwards through me. Not me moving through time. This difference seemed obvious now. A new bathroom suddenly existed in the house. The cats had shredded up many rolls of toilet paper in there. Chaos. I clung to Andrea as we looked out the kitchen window and asked her, Is the garden full of undead? No, she said plainly. My heart imploded. Chaos. I can no longer interpret the world. My perception is corrupt. The undead had invaded me. All along they were within my own being. Nothing left to cling to. And it goes on. Sorry, it's quite long. I ran upstairs and hastily made a list back in the bedroom where I grew up. My dad was downstairs, clawing at order. The lights were on, but still the undead came. The list was for Ewan, my therapist. My experiences were now symptoms. My cure had to be medical. I see undead in the garden. I see undead in the house. I cannot focus my gaze. Bright things are blurry. Dark things are undead. Auditory hallucinations. I listed all of these things. Undead screaming, wailing, I have a brain tumour, the tumour is causing the undead, I'm going to die. I'm now seconds away from my death, this is what it looked like right before I died. Andrea came home from the nightclub, help, I squawked. She came nearer with scuttling concern, or something did. I realised it wasn't concern. My cries were now muffled squeaks, undead Victorian boys grasped all around me, I was utterly helpless, I was paralysed. Andrea could almost reach me. So could they. I woke up. Order. I went to pee. The bathroom was bright and tidy. I considered looking out the kitchen window as I passed to make sure the garden was the garden. I decided against it. Chaos was a little too nearby. That's my dream. Wow. Wow. Wow, there's a lot there. Did you write that down right after you woke up or yeah. how did you remember all those details? Yeah, I wrote it. I, I went to the bathroom and then on my way back, I was like, I'm too sort of like energized and still a bit wary. You know, that way where you have a dream and you just like yeah. need to like not go back to sleep yet in case it returns. It was kind of like that. So I just wrote it there and then. And how did you feel after you, you said that it lingered, but how did you feel? Were you able to go back to sleep? Yeah, it was kind of like order was like gradually seeping back in. And like, as I looked around the room and like writing out the dream helped as well. It was kind of like order is now here again. And I think it all comes back to this idea that there's either order or there's chaos. And as soon as you remove one, there's the layer of the other one underneath. It's not the case that you can ever have neither. So as the chaos sort of dissipated, the order came back. But, I, but there's no way I was looking out that window in case the carousels of undead were there again. And it started all over again. That's such a specific visual image. Listening to you, I had the image appear in my own head of what that look would look like. And I'm actually having a hard time thinking about any kind of dream I've had that has been that visually specific. My dreams tend to be, you know, people appear, things happen, but there's never that much creativity, I feel like, well, in my dream. Like that's something out of like credit. a horror movie. I can't take credit because I played a lot of team fight tactics, otherwise known as TFT, before bed that night. One of the phases of TFT is that you have to like run 
off a little podium and grab a champion. There's like eight champions, each with their own items, like revolving on this carousel. And you have to grab one and like add it to your team, basically. So you like, oh, everyone okay. rushes out and grabs one of these monster like, and then some of them are kind of undead looking ones, you know. This one called Fiddlesticks, that is basically like a kind of ghoul creeping around on all fours, you know. So it's very yeah. much like that was just taken and then put in my garden and then made more undead and less like, you know normal even more corrupt than it is in the game and these points where you said you would kind of stop in your when you were talking about it and you would say chaos order when you were dreaming did those words appear or were you aware of those words no so i'd read 12 rules for life by peterson before going to bed that night and i was in on chapter two on chaos and order and as i woke up i realized that although you know i hadn't said the word chaos at any point during the dream when i was writing the list i was kind of like just mentally noting all the things that were wrong with me and it was escalating and escalating into more and more chaos and death and i guess like in a sense death was like the absolute terminus of all of the chaos like it has to end somewhere and if it goes on infinitely without order it ends in death or something so i gave those words to it afterwards when i realized that it was basically some kind of illustration of what i'd read like before going to bed so basically what i've learned is chill the fuck out before going to sleep don't play computer games and then read something really intense and then try to go to sleep interesting well i'm not an expert on interpreting dreams but i've had a couple times where i've woken up from a pretty intense dream and i've googled you know what does a certain thing in a dream mean and you know there's always like websites devoted to what dreams mean how to interpret dreams like one of the classic signs that you're really anxious or stressed out is if you have a dream where your where your teeth are falling out i think that's like a pretty common i've had that yeah but what was interesting about your dream is that it didn't seem to have any of the familiar tropes that happen like a familiar dream trope is i was running away from something and i couldn't get away or i was falling the free fall dream i fell off a height and i never felt myself hit the ground but i was falling or like the teeth thing you know, there's one where it's like appearing, like you show up to a really important event and you've forgotten your clothes or something like that. You know, these really extreme situations. But what you just told me doesn't have any any of those cliches, it felt like. It's interesting. Yeah, this is like the only dream, as I say, in a while that's left such an impact on me. And so I thought we could maybe use it as a segue to get into how sure. chaos and order relate not just to poker to life as well but maybe again just viewing the world through the lens of poker as we're trying to do on poker distilled on this podcast let's do it let's do it cool so you mentioned kind of before we started that you have a student that kind of fits into this theme of chaos and order i don't know any details about this student or what you're going to say but i thought we'd start with that because i think that's a really interesting kind of jumping off point yeah, so this student is actually you. No, it's not really. I'm kidding. Oh, wow. I'm kidding. <laughs> it could be, though. I mean, it could that could work, too. You've definitely... I think, yeah, yeah, maybe. There's definitely we'll ways. see what you say. I'll, I have to see what you say first before I mm -hmm. agree to it. So I'm not actually going to talk about you today. I'm going to talk about another student I have who's actually probably a better fit for the chaos side of it than you are. I think you're a fairly orderly poker player, as poker players go. And I think there's a real common paradox in poker players in general where they tend to be super dedicated and organized at least the ones that hire me do right because they're intentionally spending a lot of their resources on coaching but yet there's this absolute chaotic side to them i think poker attracts people who are moths to the flame of chaos to some extent do you agree with that first of all like the, the sort of people that get drawn into poker are tend they tend to be a bit more Maybe their door is more open to chaos than the door of like most people in life. I would say that. Yeah, I, I I think I would agree with that generally. I think to be interested in poker as opposed to any of the other million things one could be interested in is to say, I'm going to take a certain, you know, some of my resources, as, as you put it, and put them at risk. Whereas I could do other hobbies. I could collect, I don't know. What are people do? Toy trains. People collect toy, toy trains. trains Melissa. Yeah. I could be, yeah, I could be really into all of these other things that do not require such a significant risk to my resources. So yeah, I would say that there is a certain sense of wanting some chaos in your life. 
but I also feel like there's, I tend to encounter more players who fall into, I think, wanting the chaos, but also wanting this like level of control that doesn't exist, this level of order that just can't exist in a poker game. And maybe we can talk on this more as we get into this, but I think like the first thing when, when you said to me, you know, poker attracts people that are into chaos, I thought, well, no, it doesn't. It, it attracts like people that want a certain outcome and they want certain results. Mm -hmm. But I think at a high level, you're correct. It does. Yeah, I think it attracts people who want a chaotic setting and they want to impose order on that setting to achieve things that wouldn't normally be possible or something like that, as you alluded to. Yes. And this student has his life really together. Like he's served in the military. He's got a very dedicated workout regime. He's got, from what I can gather, a good family life and lots of things are going well for him. However, in poker, his mental game can become so bad that let me actually read you a list and read the audience a list of words that we put together this morning in the session we had we had this this segment was a bit of a last minute addendum to the podcast because I, I wasn't actually going to discuss any particular student but this was such a relevant thing this morning that i was like i've got to read a list of adjectives so i said to the student towards the end of our session actually after we'd done most of the therapizing of, of the student's mental game how about we write out a list of adjectives the the way that you feel when you're having a bad time when chaos is particularly high shall we say although i didn't use those terms and exhaustively sort of write out how you view yourself and how you feel within yourself in those moments where the session is going badly and you're playing badly and you're feeling very badly about it. We've all had those sessions, right? You've probably had those sessions. I think the audience can relate to this as well. The list is as follows. The student feels tantruming, alienated from his usual self, ashamed, out of control, on autopilot, self-loathing, angry, suffering from tunnel vision and playing the role of the victim any of those that you can relate to from personal experience or seeing other players in the, in the card room where you play i can relate to some of them but if i'm going to be honest i cannot relate to all of them okay so let's go through some ones you can and can't relate to i think that'd be really interesting okay can you yep did you brought up the list again yeah that would I'll, be helpful i'll go through them again so tantruming alienated ashamed, out of control, suffering from autopilot, self-loathing, self-hatred, angry, tunnel vision, and playing the role of the victim. Yeah, I can certainly relate to feeling alienated. I think that's a, that's a really interesting term because I felt alienated in other aspects of my life for various reasons. But at the poker table, I had a session actually this, this last weekend that went really, really bad. And I think the alienation I felt was feeling alienated from the other players who are around me and winning. So as players in this particular game, the players that were winning were fairly inexperienced. And it was those kinds of, that kind of session where you're watching people do things that are just fundamentally wrong, but being rewarded for it. And so they were kind of stacking chips and, you know, all around me. And meanwhile, like I'm in, on my like third buy-in being like, what is going on here? Like what happened? How did this session go down? So down in flames so quickly. But the alienation, I think, was from not only the other players, but the game and from how do you like feeling like, how do you even win at this game? I mean, there's days when poker feels like, how do you ever win? It's like trying to crawl out of a hole where the walls are made of quicksand. So I think alienation is something I've related to out of control, I think probably fits into that same basket. Autopilot, I not necessarily, I think I'm not someone that really ever gets into that mode. I think I'm, I just don't experience that. Self-hatred is a really strong word. I don't think I've ever hated myself. I've hated decisions I've made. I've hated certain outcomes and I've been angry with myself, but I think hatred is a really extreme word. Tunnel vision, I certainly suffer from. I think a lot of players do where you look at a board or you look at a certain texture and you see one outcome and you then realize, oh, I didn't even realize that this was, you know, that villain here could have easily had a straight or you know, going back and thinking to myself, oh, everything villain did up to the river made perfect sense. And I, you know, missed all of that because I was thinking that 100% about, you know, my pocket pair or something like that. Playing the role of the victim, I can't relate to this, but I'm glad that this was on the list because I think the idea of like being a victim and feeling like a victim is something that is very common with 
Well, it's common with everyone, but I think it's especially common in our culture in terms of how people talk about themselves. And I think playing the role of a victim allows you to get a certain amount of cultural capital that I think is bad. I don't think that that is a really healthy. And I think at the, in the poker world, one of the things I like is that people will, most people will say things like, I don't care about your bad beat story. Like, I don't care. Like, don't, don't tell me about that. I don't think there's a lot of sympathy for that victimhood mentality in the poker world, at least in the live poker world that I've seen. There's exceptions to this, of course, but that certainly doesn't stop someone from thinking of themselves, you know, internally as a victim, which I also think is, is dangerous, but a very interesting list and something that is very extreme. And I, I feel a lot of sympathy for this person in the sense that I've, these are very extreme emotions and it's always very difficult when someone is experiencing extreme emotions like this. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing more. One other thing we could add to this is that this is what happened to the student exclusively when they played online. So we use the analogy of like being behind the screen or the car windshield or something like that and being able to behave in completely socially unacceptable ways that the tribe, you know, in the state of nature would just never be able to accept within you. It would be a liability. So why don't we like kick people under the table and throw the cards across the room when we lose? Okay, some of us do. Phil Helmuth, for example, just kidding, Phil, he doesn't quite go that far. But some of us do things like that. Some of us threaten to burn down casinos and things like that after losing pots. So it does happen. But why, for the most part, does the student only do this online? Why does the person with road rage only flip out while they have the screen in front of them? Why does the internet troll not troll in real life? If you're serious about poker, then you'll know that there are two main ways to study the game. On the one hand, we have the theoretical, often known as GTO approach, where we're looking at Nash equilibriums. We're trying to figure out what is the most unexploitable and highest DV strategy possible against two perfect players. Then, on the other hand, we have the exploitative strategy, which is where most of the money in the real world is really made, which is about picking apart deficiencies in your opponent's games. Both of these things are incredibly difficult to study. The theoretical side is hard to study because when you look at a solver, and many coaches recommend that you just study with solvers on your own, what you'll find is you're basically looking up the answer at the back of a mathematics textbook. Seeing that answer in no way equips you to solve the problem yourself the next time, and so, inevitably, the student finds themselves lost at the table, no idea how to apply that solver output that they looked at with all of the complicated frequencies, ranges, and EVs. I was sick of that. I was sick of students studying with solvers before they understood how the game worked, and so I decided to record the Carrot Poker School. This is a rigorous academic course. It's just like something you would get in university. Poker is a very academic and rigorous topic, so I thought such a course was the only way to truly teach the game properly. The Carrot Poker School, across 33 videos of footage, the Carrot Poker School shows you how to understand the inner workings, the laws of physics of the game as it were. The Carrot Poker School gives you the bedrock on which to base the rest of your game, including all of that juicy exploitative stuff where the money is really made. I've found that Carrot Poker School graduates, people that have taken our 33 hour long video course, even people who have just taken the first grade of it, because it's split across three grades, are so much more capable of learning exploits and having a strong win rate and moving through the stakes. Without a foundation, without knowing why and how the game works, it's incredibly difficult to glean a lot from solvers or to understand where your opponent's main deficiencies lie and how to truly take advantage of those leaks. Head on over to carrotcorner.com today to have a look at the syllabuses of grades one through three of the Carrot Poker School. And if you do decide you want to take the plunge and give yourself a complete poker education, then you can save 500 UK pounds by grabbing our full scholarship bundle and getting all three grades at the same time. Perhaps my favorite thing about the Carrot Poker School is the amount of feedback you get along the way. There are homework tasks with feedback from me after every episode. And of course, our end of grade exams. There are three of these in the courses. There are three grades. You can have a go at the exam yourself. This will take you probably one to three hours, depending on how much time you want to put into it. And then you can watch the corresponding feedback video where I give you a complete rundown on how the perfect exam answer should go for each question. There's no other poker course this interactive that will give you such a strong foothold in poker theory, not just what, but why and how, check out at carrotcorner.com. Now let's get back to the content. 
And the idea is that society holds you accountable. You know, if you start throwing cards at people in the card room, you get thrown out of the bloody casino and you get made to look like an absolute idiot and you have to like go home feeling like a complete degenerate. Not that that doesn't happen normally when you go play poker at the card room, but you know, you get the point. So this student, when he went and played live and he'd actually been splitting up his time a little bit between live and online recently because we discussed like him not playing 4K hands every Saturday and playing like a mindless, infuriated, self-loathing zombie for 4K hands or 8 hours or however long that takes. It's like, what are you? Why are you doing that Like during your weekend? So he'd started going to the card room instead and he experienced absolutely none of this. And he said things like, there are good role models at the card room. There are people that are losing and they're handling it well. And if you imagine how you or I would handle losing at the card room compared to online... I think we would handle it in a much better way when we're being held accountable by society. And this takes us full circle round to chaos and order, actually, because society is order. Society is the definition of order. It's the assembly and arrangement of people into certain hierarchies, or maybe it doesn't have to be a hierarchy. It can also just be like a group or a culture that has a certain set of norms or something like that, where people are on more of an egalitarian field, playing field. But I think that is order. And when you have society bearing down upon you and watching you and judging you, you are kept in line and a better version of yourself is brought out for it. Whereas when you're isolated in this environment that no human ever has been expected to thrive in, let alone, not even survive in, let alone thrive in, like there's no way genetically that we are supposed to be prepared for nine hours of isolation playing a gambling game you know, that we've invested a ton of our self-worth into. Is it not just a complete recipe for these emotions? Isn't it just almost a set of circumstances where these emotions are unavoidable? And I want to talk later about my own experiences with emotions like these and with chaos in poker. But let's bring it full circle to today's topic for a second here. Isn't it amazing that when the student is in this environment, you know, he's writing to me on Discord, he's saying, woe is me, I never win, look at my graph for the day, look what's happening, he's being an absolute victim and he admits this himself. And then the next day we meet up for coaching and he's the most level-headed, in-check human you'd ever know. You'd look at him and you think, man, this guy really has his life together, he is nailing life. Okay, he's got some work to do in his poker mental game, but boy is he absolutely crushing it in terms of like his own self-worth and personal life and self-care. And yet then it falls apart as soon as you enter the environment of online poker. So let's talk about online poker for a second here. You're someone that's never done it. You're someone who has stayed the hell away from it. And I say that like it's heroin. I say that like online poker is some kind of myth. Because it is. Because it creates an environment that if you're not prepared to it and you dive headfirst into it for nine hours a day, you will succumb to the perils of a really bad vice. And... It's worth being honest about this, that the people who are able to grind for nine hours and still be sane at the end of it and compartmentalize that and not fall apart during it are very, very rare. So online poker, I'm going to posit the premise that online poker is basically an environment, a landscape of chaos. And by embarking on it without order, without session length, pre-session routines, study routines, study to play ratios, a coach, a solver, training packs etc etc without all the paraphernalia of order the natural state of that chaos without order is ruined you saw the undead and the carousels they were unchecked they started in the garden then they were in the house but only when the lights were off then they were in the house when it was bright and then they were in my body and they were a brain tumor and then i was dead so if you jump into chaos without any order i believe that death is the only outcome to that I wonder how many people play online poker and go down this road. So let me put it to you. Have you been avoiding online poker? Clearly you want to play live. You like that aspect of the game. But has part of you been avoiding it? Because you're quite a perceptive person. You're very emotionally in tune with things. Perhaps you've already seen and identified that this is not a nice... This is a bit of a post-apocalyptic landscape you'd be throwing yourself into if you were to play nine hours of online poker on a Saturday. I certainly think I may have thought that more on a subconscious level. I think that I'm the kind of person who is drawn to doing things in a social environment. So I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself to be like a hundred percent extrovert and I'm not a hundred percent introvert, but I'm, I certainly have a mix of both qualities. So I like the idea of playing live because you can 
put yourself into a live setting for as long as you want or for as short as you want. And then you can leave, you can get up and leave whenever you want and go home. And I've definitely gotten to the points where I've played a lot and I've felt like, okay, I've had enough of other people now. I've had enough of being around other people and doing things kind of publicly. And I'm going to just, you know, stay in for a day and do something else. And that having that control over those two aspects of my life and having the control over who I choose to spend my time with is extremely important to me. And I need to be able to have that freedom. I can't imagine being a single person, you know, living alone, in a, you know, maybe, you know, not having a lot of friends in the you know immediate area and just going online and playing poker every day. That seems to me to be a very difficult existence. I'm sure there's people out there who do it and can do it, but for me, that would not work. And I think the other really difficult part about being alone in your room playing poker is that the entire world comes to you through the screen and you begin to, I think, I think this happens to everyone, but you begin to think that that's how the entire world is. So you see this with social media a lot too. I think like if you were an alien that came down and looked at, you know, our society and only through Twitter, you'd be like, this society is like, everyone hates each other. It's so polarized. Like, how are they not at war? Like, this is just such an angry society. But if you go out into the world and you just like talk to people, I don't care. Like I'm talking obviously from the United States, you know, everyone says we're, you know, so polarized. And I think in a certain sense we are, but it's, it's so on the surface and it's so hollow. That's like, that's such a hollow kind of understanding of, I think our country and how society really works. I think like the vast majority of people are pretty polite and nice to be around. And if you go out and it doesn't matter where you go, as long as you're kind of like not someone that's trying to instigate problems, like you're going to get along with everyone. And that's kind of the beauty of diversity, but you don't get that diversity when you're by yourself. And I think an existence without diversity is really, really difficult. And I think we need diversity to function. And you also need to see your own experience reflected back in other humans and not through a screen. So when you're sitting at the poker table at a live game, let's say that you take a really bad beat and you have to sit there and, you know, just kind of deal with it. It's a lot different to do that if you're alone versus if you're at a live table and 10 minutes later, another player who, you know, maybe you feel is also a pretty solid player takes a really bad beat. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you say, okay, well, I'm not alone in this. This is kind of how it is. Or maybe the person who stacked you now loses all their chips. And so like that kind of seeing those kinds of things gives you a point of reference that I think is really important that I imagine you don't get when you're alone playing online. Yeah. And society just really forces you to behave in accordance with its norms. Like I once was in Vegas and a guy lost the pot and he stood up stared at the opponent, stared down at him menacingly, and screamed, Your mother! Your mother! Your mother! Over and over again like this. And that drew the intention of the entire casino, like the entire card room at least, and maybe the punter over there playing craps as well, you know? Like it was like literally the whole room stopped. And that's what happens when you violate a social code. Your surroundings stop. And people are shocked and they're horrified. And you're the center of attention, so... Anecdotally, when I was a kid, I was very bratty, spoiled around my dad. I had a lot of order around my dad. I had a lot of chaos around my mother, like the way I grew up. And when I was at my mother's house, I had to be very orderly and I had to install order into the chaos that was that environment. It was quite, her and her partner were quite unstable. There was always like, they were always falling out and there were, you know, like shouting fits and arguments and just like general just a lot of disruption all the time and a lot of like snap decisions about right we're going on holiday tomorrow like okay now we're coming home because we're sick of being in the caravan after one day this sort of thing and my job there was to install chaos when i was at my dad's my job was to install sorry my job was to install order when i was at my mom's when i was at my dad's my job was to install chaos because he was very like let's just have an orderly day where we plan things out and let's be very calm all the time and i would just get frustrated and throw stuff and kick him and be a brat because I needed more chaos there and I needed more order over there and that is a harrowing 
way to grow up because like eventually i know people have had worse childhoods i'm not playing that i am the most victimized child ever card i'm certainly not much people many people have had it much worse but that made me completely polarized within myself to chaos and order and to bring it back to this societal thing in the card room the reason that people can handle bad beats and things much better there and the reason that they can enjoy their session more and not go as insane when they're a live player is that the order of society is imposed upon them whether they like it or not and they don't really have a choice but to abide you can't scream your mother at somebody six times and expect not to draw some looks and that then leads to shame and being outcast from the tribe and all of these things that essentially lead to our demise again in the state of nature so yeah i thought it was quite a rant but i do think that the online world and the absence of these things in general not just in poker but in general is very frightening because it creates a blank canvas on which chaos can sprawl unchecked the undead invade the garden and then the house and then the body i love this like that my subconscious came up with this like maybe it didn't maybe it was just like oh you played tft look there's people on carousels maybe it was just doing that and i was like aha i'm a genius let me write this down but in any case it's a really cool metaphor for what happens when you take away the hierarchical inherited structures that keep us sane and those don't even have to be concrete or real things they could just be social constructs like norms of behavior and things like that and that's why the internet and online poker you said you know you're sure there are people that actually survive that and can play for nine hours a day unchecked those people are probably very atypical mentally i think they would score extremely high on the i'm not sure what the correct terminology is the autism spectrum is that the correct terminology i think so i i think so yeah anyway i won't walk on eggshells so i don't really care let's say the autism spectrum a lot of people who are quote more interested in things than people i think can survive that but most people are have i don't know like some balance between whether they're interested in things or people and for those more typical people mentally speaking that is a recipe for insanity it's not there's no like oh the strongest can survive it or it's just literally a landscape for insanity and of course that's why you have to bring order into it you have to work with peers you have to get coaching you have to set a study plan you have to have breaks you can't play for nine hours if you do you let the undead into your house that's it it's as simple as that i don't think there are people that survive it unless they're wired extremely atypically and uniquely yeah I'm going to just say one last thing before we move on to the next topic, because thinking about this idea of society being the order that's imposed on the chaos, I think this is really important because you are, as a, I think as a human, you're constantly filled with ideas of how things should be, what justice looks like for you. You're the, you know, you're the, we're all the stars of our own movies. And that is problematic in a lot of ways that mainly I think has to do with trying to fix things that are outside of our control. So the classic example is the person who is saying, I want to save the world. I care about climate change. I care about all of these, you know, kind of enormous topics that, you know, are, you know, really beyond my control, but I'm going to be out there in the streets protesting and I'm going to be doing everything I can do. And I'm going to kind of signal to everyone out there that this is what I care about. Yet that person's personal life is a complete disaster. Maybe they don't talk to one of their children or maybe their, you know, their parents, you know, they don't, they, they're feuding with their parents or their own home is complete chaos. And so what they do is they tend to turn to these huge issues because you can go out every day into the world and say, I'm fighting to fix climate change and show no results whatsoever. And no one's going to hold you accountable for it because you have this higher purpose, right? But if you say, I'm going to go and try and repair or fix one relationship in my life, someone's going to hold you accountable to that, mainly the other person that you're trying to communicate with. Or even so yourself, think, right? Because you can measure that. You can't measure how much you fix climate change at all. Exactly. And this is not to say that you shouldn't do things that are, you know, that you feel are are just or morally right. But I do think that there is a certain tendency. It's an attraction for humans to say, it's easier for me to deal with the big problems rather than the small ones, because I've received zero criticism and feedback on the big problems, but trying to fix the small ones, I receive all types of criticism and, and feedback. And relating this to poker, I think you can experience a quote unquote bad beat. And it, at the time say, that was so unfair, or it is, I hear this a lot at live games is 
players will say, well, it is what it is. And, you know, that's their way of dealing with it. But really, is it, is that really like a true statement? Like, is there anything that you maybe could have done differently? Is there any room for curiosity or investigation here? Is there any reason to maybe hold yourself accountable for any kind of decisions you made leading up to this river spot or whatever? So it's like you can embrace the chaos as a way of ignoring the order because it's easier. And I think that is it's an epidemic in a lot of areas of our society, especially with a lot of like people who are like big on virtue signaling, you know, publicly about how important they are, or maybe, you know, how morally right their cause is. But I think when you drill down, like you need being able to have that curiosity and balance the chaos with the order, not going too far in the other direction and saying, I'm an idiot. I'm so stupid. How could I have gotten into the spot? But saying, no, I'm curious what happened here. Let's, let's look at this. Let's see. It's the fork in the road. When a human is confronted with an unexpected adversity, there are two paths that literally just branch out from there. And I sometimes get my students to do this thought experiment where they're walking through a tranquil forest and suddenly there's an obstacle and they have to decide whether to go around the obstacle that way or the other way. And one way is fear, withdrawal, kind of allowing chaos in, basically saying like, I have no control over this since I have no autonomy over my situation here. All I can do is let the undead in. All I can do is step back and allow chaos to like a spilled well of ink to just to spread all over the entire canvas. Or I can say no and I can put up a dam here and I can actually say, I'm not just afraid. I might be a little bit afraid, but maybe what, what if I'm also just like 20% curious and 80% afraid? What if I get the curiosity up to 30 or 35 or 40%? Well, now I actually am inspired to do something because the explorative child does things. The scared child withdraws from things. A child is usually a two-year-old, let's say, is usually either curious, asleep, or afraid. These are like the most common things, and let's lump anxiety and nervousness and sort of anger and tantruming in with afraid, right? And let's lump happiness and all of that stuff and putting toy cars in their mouth and spitting them out again and like grabbing the sugar and throwing it everywhere and liking it. Let's throw that all in with curiosity. And I do think that when you do something wrong at the poker table or ostensibly you've done something wrong at the poker table or bad results have happened to you over any period of time it could be one hand it could be a hundred hands it could be ten thousand before just playing the victim card and saying look what's happened to me look what chaos has done to me well we know if you remove all of your order from the situation you let chaos in so possibly it was on you to just you know apply a bit of order to this and stem the flow of chaos across the canvas because you do have that power when you start holding yourself as you said you put it very well not so accountable that you're shouting at yourself and putting yourself down but accountable enough to be introspective and curious and that's a very fine balance and it fits in perfectly with what we spoke about there yeah that was interesting i wanted to move on to the next point in our kind of outline of today's discussion so you mentioned to me that this chaos and order idea relates to GTO for poker. And I think I, I may have a general idea of what that means, but I don't know what it means from your perspective. So I'd love to hear some more about that. Yeah. So obviously there's this alleged dichotomy of GTO and exploitative play. There's a lot of misconception around this topic. There are people out there in the poker world who have ridiculed one or the other. There are people out there who have said things like, I'll give you an example, let me like strawman the extreme case on each side, just because it's impossible to strongman the very extreme case, so let me just give it to you in its true form, which is actually just like pathetic, but I'll give it to you anyway. So the GTO exclusivity argument, like getting rid of exploitative play entirely in favour of GTO, goes something like, well you know in theory that a certain strategy will give you a certain EV in the long term, but you never know what your opponent is doing, so therefore you shouldn't try to like even figure out what they're doing at all. You should just play in the GTO recommended way. So that's the extreme case for GTO. The extreme case for exploitative play is like the whole GTO is has nothing to do with what's best, which is also completely false because there are certain things that are theoretically... Maybe GTO as like an output of a sim like the thing the solver spits out at you isn't the most like important part of it, but certainly the infrastructure of poker theory, like what the Carrot Poker School does, you know, building poker up the bedrock of 
the laws of physics, the axioms of the game, the things that EV rests upon, the scaffolding that holds up your thought process, that all really matters, but it's not binding. So clearly GTO and exploitative play are both completely necessary to understand what they are and to use in some way, although we should never copy GTO nor ignore it completely. What I'd like to do to bring this like round to chaos and order then is to say, well, what if we see GTO as too much order, which is like a totalitarian state, like let's say like the Soviet Union 50 years ago, let's say like North Korea, something like that, some kind of totalitarian state where most of the civilized world would readily admit that something has gone very wrong in that state, something like that, maybe Nazi Germany, something like this. And let's equate exploitative play when it's taken just in the absence of theory without the scaffolding or bedrock as too much chaos. So that would be like a kind of anarchy, like in a state where anything goes and people are killing each other in the street and like just for the sake of taking their food or taking their sexual partner or something like that. So clearly we need something in between in poker just like we do in life. And I think it's really fascinating that when you begin to understand how poker theory works, you might actually become too orderly. Like I, for sure, in like 2017, I wrote this book called 100 Hands, which I, I no longer sell on my store. I took it down because I was far too entrenched in the early stages of becoming, I guess, indoctrinated into some kind of culture of GTO at the expense of everything else at all costs. And while I was in that phase, I went way too far and I became really blind and I stopped being able to coach people well for a while. I stopped being able to understand EV. So apologies to you listening. If you were coached by me in 2017, I'm really sorry. I was going through a phase, you know, I was going through a, a sort of things have to get bad before they can get good phase. And boy, did they get good when I emerged out the other end of it, but that was bad. So I think in life and in poker, we flip between too much chaos, too much order, and unless we get the balance roughly right, which is kind of like a 50-50-ish thing, we do end up like kind of miserable. Because like in life you could imagine being oppressed by your own regimes to the point that you're miserable and you don't inject enough fun or creativity into your life. That's too much order. And you could also imagine, you know, going off the rails, abusing alcohol or drugs, living... I used to live very hedonistically. I once wrote a poem when I was like 25 called subjective hedonism for beginners like this is what an absolute <laughs> ethical screw up i was i actually thought that was the ethos by which i should live my life and it was horrific and it said things like my nectar is pleasure my poison pain it's really simple within my brain and shit like this as a few lines come back to me and it was so cringe now i look at it and i'm like that is just like a naive boy that thinks that utter chaos is a remedy to the struggles of blending chaos with order. That's a real problem and it's not easy and it takes a lot of courage to say, I'm going to impose just the right amount of order. That takes courage, but then it also takes courage to open the door enough to the undead to let a few of them into your house, but not too many of them as well and let the chaos in. So yeah, that, those are my thoughts on that. So interesting. Okay, I'm not like a big Star Wars person. I'm not like someone that quotes Star Wars movies Thank or God. anything like that. Like I, I've seen some of them, okay? I've seen some of them. So like, I just happened to watch this clip yesterday from, I forget which movie it was, but the line that I thought was really interesting was, it was a fight between two characters. And I don't even remember, I think it might've been Luke Skywalker and someone, but the bad guy said something and the bad guy was a Sith. And he said, Luke's response was, only Siths deal in absolutes. And I was like, I like that. I like that because that's a so there's like a couple of lines from Star Wars movies that are just like really good. That's a really good one. The other good one is when Han Solo is driving through a uh, like some kind of like asteroid field and someone says like one of the robots says you have like zero percent zero point one one percent chance of surviving this and he just says never tell me the odds. I like that a lot too. But this idea of like only sits deal in absolutes is a really interesting, I think, statement because. Dealing in absolutes is a recipe for disaster. And whether it's dealing in absolutes with people, so it's like you see this in, in politics a lot, people are either 100% bad or 100% good. Either they're on my side or they're on the bad side and there's no blending, there's no complexity, there's no nuance. Like 
this is not only is it a really boring and uninteresting way to live, and I think turns you into a really boring and uninteresting person to be around, but also I think that it's really, uh, it, it makes you look at the world like a child because you look at the world like a comic book where there's like the heroes and the villains. And that is not how life works. And that's humans are way more complex than that and way more interesting than that. And I think poker is way more interesting and complex than, you know, all GTO or all exploitative. So, you know, I know that those were extreme examples that you gave at the beginning of this segment, but I think there is a lot of truth to maybe not being all in one camp, all in the GTO camp and all in the exploitative camp, but certainly favoring one or the other and favoring one or the other when it's convenient. So you do something, and I'm maybe guilty of this, you make a mistake at the poker table and you say, well, theoretically, that was the right move, so I'm fine. <laughs> so just to expand on that point, right, for yeah. a second, yeah. what we're saying there is that you take the lowest EV play out of two plays and then justify it because in a different world, a synthetic theory world, it would be as good as the other play. Or better. Yes. Yep. Or, or even like a pre-flop strategy, for instance, like, okay, I'm I'm under the gun. I've, I just got three bet by, you know, um, cutoff. So I have a general rough idea of what the cutoff ranges are. So I think I can four bet with, you know, what I have. And I'm going to, okay, I'm going to four bet. And then they just jam. <laughs> and they're just like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm playing against humans. And this human doesn't want to fold in this situation. So here I am. And maybe you could see that that human was like a 65, 48, like VPIT PFR maniac. And yet somehow the student still puts the authority of the chart before right. the real life situation. Right. And I love charts. I will be, I am unembarrassed. Like I'm not embarrassed to say that I am, I love charts. I look at them a lot and I am you know, very much like, I'm not someone that just ignores them, but and I also look at them as a source of comfort a lot of times too, which is probably not good. But I always have to go through that mental process of saying, okay, I know what the chart says roughly here. Okay. But what is actually going on? So I know what the order is, but what is the chaos? How do I mix that into my decision? And maybe there's a little bit of chaos here. Maybe the person I'm playing against is like a really, you know, pretty solid player who you know, understands what the range should be in this spot and is reacting accordingly. And I can play, you know, fairly close to what a chart would do. But that doesn't happen a lot, at least not in the games I play in. Therefore, there's chaos. And how do I react to that chaos? How do I adjust my own behavior to that chaos? And that, in my opinion, is what makes poker worth playing. I agree. That balance. Like, if you don't do that and you're just reacting on autopilot or according to some sim or, or according to something that you believe is theoretically the right thing to do like i don't know like you might as well be a programming computer or something that that to me is just not interesting and it's also i think what makes poker attractive to so many different types of people they may not be aware of that but i do feel like that is the secret sauce absolutely yeah there are people out there that will say well solver says this and that will be their game or I, I take this play because I have the Ace of Diamonds blocker. And it's like what people are so bad at in poker is they're not able to sift through the data and spot the really important things and hone in on them. Phil Galfon said something on Twitter the other day I really liked. He said, protection is a thing, but you'd be a paraphrase here, but you'd be better off ignoring it because there are way more important things. And I thought that was a lovely way of putting it. No surprise from Phil, like one of the best poker minds out there and one of the best communicators out there. So people are very bad at seeing a factor and then just going with that factor straight away of like basically people that aren't trained in i don't know like almost people that are have like absolutely no philosophical prowess at all they're not able to wait something and they get something and just go a is present a points in y direction a therefore y and that's like me saying well coffee is present coffee points in the direction of me drinking coffee but it's actually like the woman across the street's coffee that's just walked out of Starbucks. So no, actually, it's not appropriate for me to go and drink that coffee. It's that ludicrous that you're misapplying a rule or you're saying because the factor points in the direction, it's therefore sufficient for the destination of that direction. And if people could do a better job of actually saying, like, it's a signing order. I like this idea today that it's not for us to just hope that order is opposed on chaos. It's not for us just to say, woe is me, I'm the victim someone save me from this chaos, maybe we have to actually 
impose our own order upon that. Yeah. And I mean, I think chaos too is the gambling aspect of poker. I think that's something that obviously you see all the time. I think it's definitely a factor with when you're in certain situations and you may know that something is like in theory, you should not take a certain line, but you know that you're gambling if you do and you choose to take it. And that is, I think, one aspect of favoring chaos over order. And that's not to say that I think the idea of like what's gambling and what isn't is a pretty big topic. And I don't really want to go into that too far. But I do think that there are people who come to poker because they love the chaos of it and they love it so much that that's all they like. And so these are the kind of people who will say things like, and I hear this a lot in my card room is two card games are too slow for me. I need Omaha. I need a five card game. I need bomb pots. I need, you know, this kind of constant action. It's too slow to sit there and just look at two cards and boring. And and I, you know, this always kind of privately like irks me when people say like, oh, it's just hold them is too boring, you know, but those people are out there and that's certainly a way of approaching poker. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's a choice that people make. And as long as they're aware that they're making that choice and they're not, I mean, I think they're adults and they can make that choice, but ultimately the point is, is that that is embracing the chaos of the chaotic side of poker and not the order side of poker. And so as much as we say you can't rely too much on theory and you have to have this balance, like you also can't just be like a hundred percent, you know, I'm going to just gamble or you also just can't be a hundred percent. I have a read on this person and this person did this two or three hands ago and they've said this. And so therefore that means that, and I can do that and, you know, construct this like long narrative of exploits in your head and then make a move that's you know totally wrong. You have to know where you're deviating from. So if you don't know how bad a play would be in the order realm of theory, how can you possibly choose it just because there's a bit of chaos in the mix? Maybe there's not enough chaos there. Maybe, yes, it's not a completely orderly situation like you've studied, but it's not so chaotically different that you can now bet the middle of your range on the turn. It's like, I thought he was weak, so I bet. It's like, yes, but you bet like pocket tens on the turn on King Queen Deuce Deuce after your flop C bet was called. Like, why would you bet that low down in your range? Like that middling part of your range? Because I thought they were weak. Meaning you thought they had what? Well, I thought they had like stuff like under pairs. It's like, okay, but like you don't need to those have two out. So back to Galfon's point, protection is a thing, but no, you probably shouldn't care about it, at least not in that spot. Without getting too technical, I think people just really can so easily go too far in one direction and almost every student that I teach is too far in one direction. I would say it's much more common these days to find people who are absolutely far too orderly and they want to make the game such a rigid orderly thing that they're completely safe from chaos. They've basically closed their door to chaos completely. That doesn't work. And then there are a few people who are too chaotic that just sit down and just say, oh yeah, but this guy was doing this. I used to have a lot of conversations back in the day where the student would say, I made this call and I know it's not meant to be a call, but I called and I'll say, okay, so why did you call? And they'll say, because I put him on this exact type of range. that's really narrow and like almost clairvoyant to me. And I said, and how confident are you in your read? And he said, really confident. I said, so why am I here? What do you want me to do about that? You've told me you basically know your opponent's hand. And then you've asked me to give you feedback on your play. Like, are you brain dead? Like, are you the sort of player that's like, I know he has ace 10, yet should I fold because the theory tells me to fold? Like, surely not. So one of two things is going on. Either you didn't know he had ace 10 and you're now imposing almost like an unrealistic degree of order to a chaotic situation to try to solve it. Or you knew he had ace 10, like you legitimately just had a really strong read on your opponent's range. And then you're, why are you doubting yourself in that case? So it all comes back full circle to chaos versus order you know, to what extent can you impose order onto the chaotic world of poker and to what extent do you have to embrace a bit of fluidity in your reasoning, creativity to actually put some chaos into the order so you're not just copying GTO. I could talk all day about the GTO exploitative dichotomy here. So I think we'll, finishing up on this last point, and and I know that you talked a little bit about your own backstory with chaos and GTO, but I wanted to kind of hear some more about that and I know you wanted to talk about that a little bit more. 
I've got like one afternoon in mind that just really stands out to me. Do you ever get like one day in your life that you just remember for some reason, even though it wasn't a particularly like eventful day? I was playing poker and I remember like having aces. And it was one of those days where it felt like poker was climbing out of the well with no ledges to hold on to. It was just like climbing out of this vertical, really high structure, like impossible quicksand was the way you put it. And every pot I got into, I lost. I remember sitting at my study in this old flat that I, I lived in with a former partner and I remember getting into a hand where I had aces and I got like raised on the flop and I called down multiple streets of aggression and they had a set that they'd flopped. And I just like closed the session. I went for a run and as I was running, I just remember thinking, what on earth am I doing playing this game? This game is horrific. It's torturous. There's no escape from it. And it felt like just being in a blender. It felt like being completely trapped in a blender and it felt like the chaos was out of control. Like that idea that when you're a professional poker player, you wake up in the morning and this is like Zoom. This is like 200 Zoom or something back in the day, cramming hands in to try and get some kind of hourly to make a, a living and being just put through the blender of variance. So some days like you're on a massive upswing, you win like 15 buy-ins, stuff you couldn't do live, right? You win like 15 buy-ins one day, the next day you lose six, the next day you lose another 12 and now you're down three buy-ins for the weekend instead of up 15 and trying to calibrate going from being up 15 buy-ins to down 10 buy-ins in like two days that is so much chaos that I don't really believe that many humans can put up with that. And I don't think that they should put up with that because it's so... You'd have to work so incredibly hard against your natural wiring in order to be able to accept something like that. And it was at that point where I actually said to myself, do you know what? I can't play poker full time. I can't do it. I either need to go and get a job. And, you know, I ended up like doing a bit of teaching for a while in, in Italy and stuff like that. And I came back and was like, can I make poker work for me or not? And I was like, the only way I can make it work for me is if I do the part of it I love. And teaching, this is the, the part I want to finish on today. I don't know how you feel about this, but teaching to me brings out the best, the most orderly yet creative version of me. It brings chaos and order perfectly together because I have a social responsibility and due diligence to give the student a good service because they're paying money for it and blah 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 but also I'm really inspired by it and I want to like bring chaos and creativity to the mix as well and when I discovered teaching poker was something I was quite good at and I really loved and I discovered all these different ways of doing it what I actually did was I actually crafted a poker career that was way more orderly than the average poker career because poker is in essence chaotic and what I had to do is find a way to keep the parts I loved about it, the order that I loved about the game, the GTO side of things, the theory side of things, the exploit side of things, all of that chaos and order, while making the overall endeavor more orderly. And the only way I was able to do that was to bring society into it, bring a role of accountability to others into it, bring a business into it where I had to make decisions that allowed me to like make a certain amount of money, not just by like clicking buttons and hoping the cards fell my way. So I think my whole journey in poker has very much been one of finding a way to chisel out an orderly existence in a chaotic backdrop, which is just what poker is naturally. It's very chaotic. So I thought that was actually relevant. That's really interesting. I think that there's a lot there. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is I know how you feel when it comes to the chaos of playing poker. And this last weekend, I had the exact same thing happen to me where, you know, on Saturday I ran really well on Sunday, I had one of the worst sessions I've had in a while where I was just, I just felt like I was just getting beat up for like six or seven hours. I was at the table and then yesterday things kind of evened out a little bit, but it was just like, it felt like I was a pinball, like you're just getting hit back and forth between like extremes. And I think for me, the order that I seek is, well, I'm not a professional player, so I have a job that gives me a lot of order maybe too much order. And I think that my balance is achieved through the chaos of poker balance with the order of my job. But I also look at poker as a job as well. And so by looking at it as a job, that gives me the order. So instead of going to the card room and thinking about it as like, this is a recreational activity, this is something that I'm pursuing as a hobby, I look at it as like, I'm going to pretend this is my job, 100%. Like this is the only thing I do. And that imposes an order where I'm very mindful of what I'm spending on food, what I'm spending on gas, all these little things that kind of add up that you would be mindful of if you were running a business. It's like, what's coming in? What's going out? What am I left with at the end of the month? That's how I think about poker. Even though it's not my full-time job, I treat it as if it is. 
And there's a really interesting, I think maybe this will be a good point to end on, but there's an interesting philosophical concept of, and I don't know exactly where this started or who wrote this first, but the idea of acting as if. So you want to achieve something, you want to get somewhere in life, act as if you've already achieved it, act as if you're already there. So for me personally, I act as if I play professionally, even though I don't, but I act as if I do, because when you act as if, I think that that imposes a certain amount of order on the chaos. And I just came up with that. That's <laughs> so awesome. I'm, it just kind of naturally came to me, but I think that makes sense. And with poker, if you don't have that balance, like you said, for you, it was teaching, starting a business, putting that order onto the chaos, and you're not acting as if, then you are likely to have the dead invade the chaos, invade your house, invade your brain, as you put it. I think that's right. I just kind of, just kind of riffing, but that seems to me to be correct. Yeah. <laughs> I think we both agree that poker in its natural form is too chaotic. Yeah. And we both also agree that when you try to put order onto poker, you can also go too far in that endeavor. And you can become too rigid and, and full of GTO ideas. And like I was in 2017 when I wrote that book that I'm not so proud of now. And what really has to happen in order to make poker just orderly enough that it doesn't lose its magic, but also orderly enough that you stop the undead invading fully, is that you have to find the balance. You have to have the right amount of GTO. You have to have the right amount of exploitative stuff. You have to have the right amount of structure, but not so much structure that you become a rigid robot that's lost their spark for the game. I have this thing called the grit engine in my book, Poker Therapy, and it's about inspiration is one of the four pillars of what allows long-term grit, which I deem to be essential for the poker professional. And if you lose inspiration, your goals no longer make sense because they were formed from an inspiration. Then you forget that. Then the goals don't mean anything anymore. The motivation wanes, the discipline wanes the four pillars of the grit engine fall apart, as it were. So you have to have enough inspiration, basically, to keep chaos high enough. Like if there's a chaosometer, like a gauge that measures chaos, inspiration scores very high on the chaosometer because what inspiration really does, in my opinion, is it says, this is what things aren't, but this is like an alternate reality that isn't true right now. And that to me is chaotic. An alternate reality that isn't currently true is in some sense chaotic and it's in some sense orderly as well because it gives you a direction and something to strive for. I've just found that these two notions are so beautifully harmonized with every aspect of life that it's as if life was rigged, Melissa. It's as if there was, after all, I'm an agnostic slash atheist somewhere on that end of the spectrum, but it is as if, after all, these notions are put there by something that knows what's up and is like, integrated them beautifully and everything and i can sort of see why design arguments get off the ground you know for the existence of whatever you want god to mean in the first place i think chaos and order are just so ridiculously wonderful as concepts for explaining the world and everything within it and not even just real things like buildings and atoms but also like conceptual structures as well like poker and ideas like that that when you understand chaos and order and you understand the the main aim being to balance them perfectly and you understand yourself as an actual responsible agent in that process and you understand the role of society and institutions in helping you do that, I think you just have a better shot at a poker career and a better shot in life in general. So maybe we can finish with that idea. Sounds great to me. All right, guys, do let us know what you think of Poker Distilled. We are on Spotify if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or another associated platform, then you can check us out on YouTube as well. And you can see us. Not that we do anything exciting when we're speaking, but no. you can watch us there as well. We just sit there basically and look at the camera, but you can do that. And do let us know what you think. It's not often easy to get feedback about a podcast because people stick it on in their car. They, they never like leave a comment or a review. I'd love it if you guys, we'd both love it. I'm sure if you guys could drop us a comment on any platform like Apple Podcasts, for example, YouTube, Spotify, do like and subscribe on YouTube. It really helps. We want to know how this is going down with you because there is always that detachment when you make a podcast. You don't get quite the same feedback you do from videos. Melissa, I'd also like to let people know how they can get in touch with you because a lot of people know who I am. They've maybe just met you for the first time in this podcast. So you are at Melicious, M-E-L-I-C-I-O-U-S Poker. One word, malicious poker? One word, yep. On Twitter. So you can reach out to Melissa there, let her know, um, tag her, tag me, let us know what you think about the podcast. I guess we'll see you next time. Anything else you want to add? No, that's all. I think this has been really a really interesting topic. And I think it's given me a lot to think about. And I also appreciate hearing about the dream. I think that was a really good way to bring 
to bring this topic up and so I love telling people about my dreams I'm so glad I got to like not just like I mainly wanted to tell you about it because I thought you'd be interested but I'm also very happy that I got to tell one of my stupid dreams to like maybe a thousand or two thousand people that's more than I ever <laughs> more people than I ever thought I'd get to tell a dream to when I was a kid so there we have it well that so there are a certain amount of those people might turn the po- the podcast off as soon as you started talking about your dreams. So you have to factor that. Thanks in as for well. that. That really helps okay. my self esteem and doesn't at all make me feel like a, a tragic victim of the world and that I want to retreat into chaos and let chaos consume me. In no way does it make me feel that way. Well, I need to go. I need to go because I need to go into my order. <laughs> you need to go do order. I need to go do. I don't know what it even is when you finish work for the day, not to make you jealous and you start relaxing. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just started my day. That sucks for you. It does. On that note, we'll let you go into order. I'll go into the chaos of playing computer games and dreaming about undead. And we'll see you on episode three of Poker Distilled. Thanks guys. Bye.